So we will look at some review questions here for childhood growth and development. Question one, a mother and her baby present for a routine visit. There are no complaints at this time. Mom is breastfeeding and there are four to six diapers to be changed per day. Stool is yellow and seedy. Physical exam is unremarkable. Primitive reflexes are gone. The child is able to sit up without support, but cannot yet roll over. Uh, the child reaches for objects placed in front of him, but shows no interest when the object is placed beneath a blanket. He does not say words yet. As you place the baby on the exam table, he begins to cry and look to his mother. When he returns, he is immediately consoled. Which of the following is the most likely age of this child? A, two months, B, four months, C, six months, D, eight months, or E, ten months? Okay, so I'll give you some time to pause it here. And the answer to this question is C, six months. So this is a very common style of question in the USMLE. Uh, they want you to know about the, uh, some of the major developmental milestones. Now, in clinical practice, you're not going to ever have to answer a question like this. Uh, because you'll know the age of the child. What you're going to be doing in clinical practice is... Uh, know the age of the child and make sure that they have attained all the milestones that they should have attained uh, by that point. And remember that milestones, uh, I give them here uh, as sort of an average age when you see them, but milestones, you don't just wake up on your, on your first birthday and you're able to cruise and say and recognize a few words that you didn't know yesterday. Uh, this is a this is a range, and so uh, it's not. Uh, it, it could happen a few weeks before, or a few weeks after, or even a month or two before, or a month or two after. Uh, so, for instance, sitting unsupported, that can happen anywhere between four and seven months. Uh, likewise, walking can happen any time between twelve and fifteen months. So, this is more of a guide, uh, but. Uh, when you go down your list of, of, uh, uh, of all of these milestones, you should be able to tell what age the child is because uh, the milestones that they have attained are all earlier uh, than, than that age. So looking at these milestones, the child's able to sit up unsupported. That happens between four and seven months. Grasping and visualizing an object happens around four months. Uh, stranger anxiety, preference to the caretaker, usually the mother, but really any caretaker uh, that the baby is in constant uh, or frequent contact with, happens around six months. The primitive reflexes tend to go away by six months. That's like your moral reflex, your uh, grasp reflex, rooting reflex, and so forth. Uh, the pincer grasp happens at about eight months. Remember, the pincer grasp is how a baby picks up little objects with their finger and thumb. Uh, so that happens around eight months. Uh, rolling over and crawling happens around eight months. Object permanence happens around nine months. So this is uh, when you place the object beneath a blanket. If the baby doesn't have object permanence, the baby thinks that the object is gone. It disappeared. It vanished. And so that's why he doesn't show any interest. Uh, cruising happens around one year of age, and then saying and recognizing a few words, that's around one year of age as well. So all of these things that the baby can do happens before six months of age. Uh, and so that's why we can guess that this baby is six months old. The baby can't be four months because uh, stranger anxiety usually sets in around six months, so that would be too early. Um, at the same time, uh, by the same token, rolling over and crawling, since the baby can't do that, the baby's probably not eight months old. And that's just assuming that this baby is normal. And like I said, when you're in the clinic and actually practicing this stuff, you work the you work backwards compared to this question, where you're you have the the child's age in front of you, and you want to make sure that they have attained all the uh, milestones that a child at that age should have uh, obtained by that point.
All right. Question two gives you a 15-year-old girl presenting to your clinic complaining of fatigue over the past three months. She denies any other symptoms. She has no significant past medical history. She had menarche at age 12 and describes her periods as heavy and requires about six to eight tampons per day, usually for about eight days. Her height and weight are within normal parameters. Physical exam is remarkable for mild pallor. Pelvic exam is normal. She's on no medications or supplements. She denies sexual activity. CBC is performed reveals a hemoglobin of 9.4, hematocrit of 27, white count of 9.1, platelets 305, MCV 76. Which of the following are appropriate interventions at this time? So choose all that apply. A, beta HCG levels. B, thyroid function tests. C, LH, FSH, and androgen levels. D, gynecology referral. E, LFTs. F, coagulation studies, PT, PTT, and bleeding time, uh, and G, supplemental iron. All right, I will give you some more time to pause here. And our answers are... A, B, D, F, and G. So this is a patient, a very, this is a very common presentation that you'll see in a family practice clinic or possibly OBGYN if you uh, work there. Uh, but uh, this is very common, this is menorrhagia. And uh, when you have a patient with menorrhagia, especially when it's a teenage girl, uh, we're thinking about two or maybe three things at the very forefront of, uh, of our concern. So we're thinking of possible pregnancy. That's something we need to rule out right away, and this could be like a pregnancy loss. This is probably unlikely in this case, since uh, this patient describes that she usually has a heavy flow, so this has gone on for some time. And of course, you'd want to ask her, how long has have you had heavy periods, and has it changed? Because a, a lost pregnancy would be something that is new. She didn't have it last year. She got it in the last month. Um, another thing we want to think of is possibly hyper or hypothyroidism, and that can lead to menorrhagia. And then another thing, and this is probably the biggest one that you want to think of because it's so common, is von Willebrand's disease. And von Willebrand's disease will increase your bleeding time uh, because it affects platelet uh, adhesion. And so uh, patients, teenage girls especially, uh, who have menorrhagia, we really think of von Willebrand's disease. Uh, some of the other bleeding disorders we're not really concerned of because when you're dealing with a woman, very rarely do they have hemophilia. Um, and there are other possible bleeding disorders, but they're less common than von Willebrand's disease. So how do we, uh, do we uh, manage this patient? First of all, we know that she has pallor, um, and so that is consistent with blood loss. So we want to get a CBC. The CBC shows indeed that she has anemia. And right away when you see that a patient has anemia, in this case hemoglobin of 9.4, you want to go directly to look at your MCV. Um, and your platelet count. And the platelet count is normal, and the MCV is low. And so in this case, you can do a smear, but based on the patient's history of blood loss, uh, this is likely going to be a hypochromic uh, microcytic anemia because of iron loss, so an iron deficiency anemia. Um, so that's all consistent with menorrhagia. Uh, the other uh, the other things that we're looking at, uh, her pelvic exam, you can get infections and that can cause uh, menorrhagia as well. And then also uterine fibroids uh, can cause menorrhagia. And so that's what we're doing the pelvic exam for. Okay, so uh, let's just look at our differential diagnosis of menorrhagia. We kind of already talked about this, but bleeding disorders is uh, something to think of. Uh, particularly von Willebrand's disease, thyroid disorders, either hypo or hyperthyroidism. So you want to get a thyroid function test in any patient that's got menorrhagia as a new complaint. Uh, pregnancy or pregnancy loss, that's as simple as getting a beta HCG level. Rule out pregnancy or pregnancy loss. 
Cervical infection is a possibility. Uh, that's typically from a sexually transmitted disease. So the fact that she has no uh, sexual activity uh, is puts this uh, lower in our uh, suspicion. But you can, when you do the vaginal and the pelvic exam, uh, generally cervical infections will be pretty apparent. Uh, trauma, and that will usually come in the history, and then uterine fibroids and polyps. Question three, a father and his daughter present for a routine well child visit. There are no complaints at this time. She's tracking in the 55th percentile for height and the 50th percentile for weight. She enjoys riding her tricycle, playing with her friends. She can hop in place and has been successfully potty trained for the past six months. She knows her age, her full name, and she speaks to you in short sentences that are easily understandable. She can copy a circle and a square, but has some difficulty copying a triangle. What is the most likely age of this child? A2, B3, C4, D5, or E6 years? Okay, so look at your milestones and uh, try to figure out what, what these milestones correspond with. All right, the answer here is C, four years. So at uh, four years, I'll, I'll, these milestones uh, pretty much correspond exactly with four years of age. So at four years of age, uh, a child should be able to ride a tricycle. Now, a tricycle is a skill. So if the child doesn't have a tricycle, they may not be able to ride it, but they should be able to have the faculties and the coordination and the motor skills to ride a tricycle. Playing with friends, this is together play or social play, and this happens at about four years of age. Okay, so this would be like something like playing house, playing games with other people, uh, and this is in contrast to parallel play, which happens at about two years of age, where kids will play around other kids, but they're not playing with each other so much as they're playing around each other. Hopping in place is a motor skill that's generally developed by age four. This is very easy to test in the clinic. Anytime you have a four-year-old that you're doing for well-child physical, you should ask them to hop in place. Uh, and then successful potty training for the past six months. Not all children will be potty trained by four months, uh, sorry, for, by four years. Um, that can take up to five years of age, but all kids should be potty trained by the time they reach school age, which is about five, six years of age. Uh, I would say five would be the cutoff, uh, at which point you may need to consider working the child up. But a lot of children are potty trained by about three to four years of age, and so this child is no exception. She's four years old, and she's been potty trained for the last six months. Uh, she knows her age, full name. That happens at about four years of age, around four years. Remember, this is all arranged, though. And then she speaks to you in short sentences that are easily understandable. So the rule of thumb for how understandable the child is when they talk is their age divided by four. So, uh, and that's pretty much for ages two to four. So at two years of age, two over four is half. So about 50% of what they say should be understandable. At three years of age, about three quarters or 75% of what they say should be understandable. By four years of age, they should be pretty much completely understandable. And then finally, copying shapes. This is fine motor skills. Uh, a circle, children should be able to copy a circle by two years of age. A square should be able to be copied by, I'm sorry, a uh, circle should be able to be copied by three years of age. A square should be able to be copied by four years of age. And then a triangle should be able to be copied by five years of age. Okay, so circle at three, square at four, and triangle at five. So this is a four-year-old child, most likely. So here's a list of your motor milestones. Note, copy a square and hop All right, age four. I would also recommend that you memorize the blocks. So two to three blocks at 16 months, four blocks at 18 months, and then at 24 months or two years old, they should be able to put together seven blocks. 
you know, that's not really something we look at in the clinic because a lot of kids don't have blocks anymore. They've got iPads. Um, but this is just good trivia to know for the test. It'll get you a few uh, free points. Another thing really good to know that doesn't, isn't really motor skills, but uh, weight. So this is imperative to know this for the test. And it's good for clinical practice because we're always concerned about failure to thrive as a possibility especially if you're working in poorer areas. So at four months of age, baby should double their birth weight. At one year of age, baby should triple their birth weight. And at two and a half years of age, baby should quadruple their birth weight. Okay. Uh, so here's some of uh, the social milestones. Actually, no, these are cognitive milestones. Sorry. Uh, so... Uh, four years of age, they should be able to tell story and use past tense. Three years of age, they should know their age and sex, uh, and they should be mostly about 75% understood by strangers. Uh, some other good ones to know, uh, I would say uh, establishing eye contact at one month of age. That shows that the visual system has developed, their visual acuity has improved. Babies are about 2,200. Uh, when they are born. So they have got, they're have basically legally blind when they're born. Uh, object permanence, this is a big one that happens at nine months of age. Also consonant or monosyllabic babbling happens at about nine months of age. So there's a big difference between consonant babbling uh, and like that would be like ma 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 da 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 pa 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 pa. Uh, there's a big difference between consonant babbling and words and it happens to be that mama and dada are consonant babbling, monosyllabic babbling. And there's a big difference between that and a word. So mom or dad are going to see mama and dada as the baby's first word. That could be a word, uh, but in order to definitively say that that's a word and the baby understands that as a word, is that the baby, like for instance, sees their mom and says mama, or sees their dad and says dada, because at that point, they've taken a sound and associated it with a, 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 a visual object. Uh, so if they just say mama, 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 and uh, that's it, and they don't associate it with anything, or you can't see that they associate it with anything, that's not a word. So it's good to know sort of the difference uh, between that. Now, certainly if they say no, or milk, or something more complex like that, then that's certainly a word. Uh, so by one year of age, they should be able to say a few words, and that vocabulary rapidly develops, uh, especially between one and three years of age. Okay. Uh, and these are some of your social milestones. Uh, some big ones are stranger anxiety, so it's around six months of age. Before that, they're pretty much happy being held by anybody. Uh, but they'll prefer their caretaker after six months of age, and that will continue until about school age, about four or five years of age. They're really going to prefer to be by their parent. They're going to be a, a very anxious being around uh, somebody else, but that will start to uh, abate as they get older. Object permanence is a big one, too. That happens at nine months of age. That's a big, uh, that could be considered cognitive, too, I suppose. Um, tantrums start at about one year of age. Uh, then uh, your parallel play uh, happens at two years of age. And, um, and then sexual modesty at four years of age, um, along with together play and potty training. I uh, got a good story with the sexual modesty when I was uh, about eight, nine years old. And I was in, actually, no, I had to be younger than that. I must have been about seven. Um, I had boy, uh, boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, and I uh, had a bunch of friends over, and we were doing crafts or whatever we were doing for our Cub Scout meeting, and my sister comes running out. She's two years old, and she is totally naked and runs out in front of all my friends, and uh, it's, clearly the sexual modesty had not developed. Uh, so kids under the age of four will be totally happy, naked, at about four years of age. They should have some level of modesty where they know that being naked in front of strangers is not okay. All right. 
So question four. So we're dealing with this patient that we just talked about. Which of the following is or are appropriate advice and actions for this visit? Choose all that apply. A, review immunization. B, counsel child about healthy eating choices. C, counsel about helmet use. D, counsel child about stranger behavior. E, counsel parent about healthy eating choices. F, encourage daily multivitamin. So choose all that apply. And in case you want to go back, we will look here at this vignette again. So you can pause it here if you want. And then we'll go back to our answer choices. So choose all that apply. Okay, the answers here are A, C, D, E, and F. So reviewing immunization, that's going to be something you pretty much do at every well child visit. Um, and it's not, not because you need to do immunizations at every well child visit. Uh, however, you want to make sure every, with every visit that the child is up to date on their immunizations. And there are a lot of immunizations that kids are going to need, certainly more earlier on than later on. Uh, counsel about helmet use, so she's riding a tricycle. Uh, at some point, probably within the next couple of years, she's going to be riding a bicycle. Either way, she needs to be wearing a helmet when she's on a trike or a bike. Uh, counseling the child about stranger behavior. Remember, stranger anxiety begins to abate a little bit, normally around four or five years of age. And so kids start to get really inquisitive. They start to get social. Uh, and... So it's very important that a child knows what not to tell a stranger. And generally, the best advice is don't talk to strangers if your parents aren't around with you. Uh, so that's going to be important uh, as well. Usually, you won't have to tell a two-year-old about stranger behavior because they don't want to be around strangers. Uh, counseling parents about healthy eating choices. So note that you don't counsel the child about he healthy eating choices. So the child's four years old. They're going to eat whatever their parent gives them that they enjoy. Uh, really, the child at four years of age does not choose or get their own food that they pick out. Uh, it's pretty much got to come from the parent. So you'll counsel the parent about healthy eating choices, not so much the child. Plus, the child's not really going to understand what you mean by saying you can eat, you should eat this and not that. They're not going to understand the consequences of that it can impact your health, impact your weight. You can become obese if you eat too much junk food. And so counseling the child really is not going to do anything. Now, when this child is more like eight or nine and they can reach and get into the cabinet and they're eating on their own and eat, picking out their own food without their parents around, at that point then it can be okay to counsel the child about healthy eating choices, eat your fruits and vegetables, um, make sure that you're uh, not drinking too much pop, soda, uh, and so that can be more appropriate. But uh, the reason we're not counseling the child directly about healthy eating choices is because she's probably not going to understand at four years of age and she's pretty much not picking out her own food. Uh, it's coming from the parent. Now, when you have a child who's a little older, like I said, eight or nine, you'll counsel both child and parent about healthy eating choices because even though the child will be picking out some of their food, parent is the one who makes dinner and makes lunch and makes breakfast. And so it's, uh, it's important that the parent knows what the nutritional needs are for their child, as well as that the child knows uh, to make healthy choices. And also, if parents eat unhealthy, the child's probably eating unhealthy. And then finally, encourage a daily multivitamin. Uh, get those little Flintstone vitamins, chewable vitamins. They got the little gummy vitamins that are designed specifically for kids helps to ensure that they're getting those micronutrients uh, that they need uh, that they might not be getting in their diet, especially if the kids tend to be picky eaters. Okay, question five. A father presents with his 13-year-old son complaining of his son's height. The boy is 4 foot 10 inches tall and 90 pounds. His father is 6 feet tall, which is the 75th percentile for a grown man, and his mother is 5 feet 8 inches tall, which is the 90th percentile for a grown woman. His father admits he himself hit puberty later than his friends, but is still concerned because next year he wants his son to try out for the JV basketball team. 
Physical exam reveals Tanner stage 2 and is otherwise unremarkable. There are no known genetic conditions in the family. Bone age study is performed and reveals a bone age that's less than the chronologic age. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Familial short stature. B. Hypogonadism. C. Undernutrition. D. Constitutional delay of growth. Or E. Kleinfelter syndrome. All right, so the answer to this question is constitutional delay of growth. So what we have here is a child that's a little bit shorter than expected. So if you plotted him out on a growth chart, he would probably be below the 50th percentile. I don't have it exactly here, uh, but you can plot him out on a growth chart, and he's. we would expect him to be tracking somewhere between where his dad and where his mom is, maybe a little closer to where his dad is. Okay, so we would expect him to be between the 75th and 90th percentile, and he probably will reach that point. Uh, however, since he's below it, um, we have to consider a possible diagnosis here, and this doesn't mean he's abnormal. Uh, what it does mean, however, is that he probably has not hit his growth spurt yet. That's the most likely uh, that's the most likely thing um, that's happened. That's constitutional delay of growth. But we need to look at his overall presentation just to make sure that it's not something uh, a little bit more malignant. Uh, so he's 13 years old. Uh, he's 4 foot 10 inches tall and 90 pounds. That's height weight proportionate. So we, we know he's not undernourished uh, because he's not extremely thin. If he was 4 foot 10 inches tall and 65 pounds, then we might be concerned he's not getting enough food. He's not getting enough energy. And so he's, he's not growing because he's not getting up calories in his diet. That's not the problem. So you can cross out under nutrition. Um, his physical exam reveals a Tanner stage of 2. That is appropriate for a 13-year-old. He has not hit puberty yet. We would expect a girl at 13 to be a little further on, but usually boys will start progressing through their Tanner stages pretty fast around 14 years of age um, and beyond. Uh, but 13, he can be right at the precipice of puberty. So, uh, so Tanner stage 2 is perfectly fine for a 13-year-old. So you can get rid of hypogonadism. Okay, and then, um, so now we've gotten rid of undernutrition, hypogonadism. Why is this not familial short stature? Well, what is familial short stature? It is a short mom, a short dad, therefore a short child. Okay, if mom is five foot two inches tall and dad is five foot six inches tall, the son is not going to be six feet. Okay, it just doesn't happen. Uh, so what we have here is a tall dad, a pretty tall mom, and so we should expect that this child is going to be tall. If he's not tall, for some reason, it's not familial short stature because mom and dad are both tall. They're not short. Familial short stature, like I said, would be if dad was 5'6", mom is 5'2", and he's 4 foot 10 inches right now, we could probably then say that he's just short like you and mom. Uh, but, in fact, mom and dad are not short, and so this is not familial short stature. This is something else. And then Kleinfelter syndrome is not the answer because Kleinfelter syndrome, remember, that's an XXY genotype. And with, uh, with the sex chromosomes, they carry a gene that expresses a, it's, it's basically a gene that makes you taller. And so this is why Kleinfelter's patients, uh, when uh, they have uh, the extra X chromosome, uh, they're going to be taller. And on the flip end to that, Turner's patients, since they only have one sex chromosome, they're going to be shorter. Uh, and so... Uh, that's the reason for tall height in Kleinfelter syndrome, short height in Turner syndrome. Uh, but uh, this kid is on the short end of things, at least for now. And so Kleinfelter syndrome is highly unlikely. Also remember with Kleinfelter syndrome, they tend to be uh, hypogonadic. Uh, and so his Tanner stage would probably still be one at this point, And he'd probably need something, to uh, hormones to get him uh, through puberty. Not always, but in a lot of cases. So this is constitutional delay of growth. 
And we can pretty much say it's constitutional delay of growth just from these bone age studies. You probably figured that out without the bone age studies, but the bone age study is really good for nailing this down. So the bone age is less than the, the chronologic age. What that tells you is that the bones still have to catch up to the child's age. And so the bones still have some developing to do. And remember, when we're talking about the bone age, we're talking about the bones getting longer. And so uh, this is classic constitutional delay of growth. So the bones still have to catch up, but they will get there. If bone age was equal to chronologic age, that would be consistent with familial short stature. So here you have it, familial short stature. This is genetic. Children of shorter parents tend to be shorter. Chronologic age equals the bone age. Okay, so their, their bone age is tracking consistently with their chronologic age. They're just going to be short adults, just like their parents. Constitutional growth delay, these are late bloomers. And I did put this in the vignette, but constitutional growth delay uh, is uh, typically has a genetic pattern. So if the parent, one of the parents, or both of the parents, hit puberty uh, a little bit later than their peers, uh, then it's very likely that their child will uh, do the same thing. Uh, so these are late bloomers. Uh, their ch the, the child will eventually reach their normal growth height after they hit their growth spurts, which just happened to come a little bit later. The chronologic age uh, is more than the bone age. The bone age will catch up after the growth spurt. Uh, 